kérem szépen, ugye hát a, a, a fogorvosok és a filozófusok a gyökerekig hatolnak. So both dentists and philosophers uh, go to the very root of problems. Everybody tries to go back to the origins of things and try to say something about the evolution of things as well. Uh, yesterday I was here to listen to a presentation when the current editor of Hankish's work Uh, works uh, was happy um, to show the students of the university anything about Hankish. Well, I was a, a university student in the early 1980s, and obviously this was the book I clearly remember. I was a student of biology, and we all wanted to have this book, and whoever had it, we just grabbed it, and we wanted to read it. It was the Yorsi Roy, the uh, um, Fasting Time uh, series, and the book was about uh, uh, social trapfuls. And also, he talked about the social issues and implications of game theory, and this is what when we first heard this term. And this thing uh, basically reflects on the whole universe, and uh, I would like to tell you that this idea, this concept, has become very fruitful in the hands of other people, and it has Um, gone beyond Hankish's ideas in this respect. So there were several waves and it has become more professional. This discipline has become professionalized. These ideas were published in the 1970s and there is another one in 1981. I actually don't remember anyone quoting and Hankish quoting. The Evolution of Cooperation was a book that has become a classic, it's, sorry, it's an article actually, and the two authors coming from different backgrounds, um, Axenor was a politologist and Hamilton was a, a scientist dealing with evolution and biology, and this is a major focal point which I would like to address now. But the roots, if we want to go back to the very origins, they are actually even earlier, about a decade earlier, And the classic, the most classic article was entitled The Logic of Animal Conflict. Why was this a, a breakthrough, a groundbreaking article? Well, this is the first uh, article where the evolutionary game theory was first referred to. It became successful very quickly to the extent at which the majority of uh, references to game theory are of biological nature. Why is it possible? It's because a, during uh, the evolution in biological situations, populations act as if they were fully rational, which means that you survive during which you can, uh, you, well, if you can reproduce during your lifetime, but we cannot reproduce, you cannot reproduce another generation later. So this is not conscious, quite obviously, you shouldn't misunderstand, but biological populations uh, act in a very rational way. And this is why this was became an, uh, a successful despite the fact that there was an earlier game theory but this was not based on biology but the one based on biology you could understand the whole concept uh, the price was a physicist and a chemist and Maynard Smith was an aviation engineer uh, you, you, it simply shows that there are so many disciplines going towards the same focal point. For a long time, Hungarian public opinion remained unaffected. It didn't get into the, the public uh, discourse. We talked about Vida, Professor Vida and Professor Juhas, but as much as I can remember, the evolutionary game theory was non-existent, especially not before 1984. It was the first date I recall uh, there was a, a scientist, Laszlo Vekerdi, 
who talked about postmodern evolutionary antithesis, and this is when he mentioned the role of the evolutionary game theory. Then there was a the Selfish Gene, the, the book uh, translated by Istvan Shiklaki, and Dawkins in this book says that after Darwin, probably the most important contribution to the evolutionary theory was the birth of the evolutionary least stable strategies. Thank you for the help. <laughs> now, these strategies, it's something like the Nash balance. It's a kind of technique that I cannot, I need to compare to, but there is a stability criterion which means if you have an alternative best choice and if it's there in a small density in the population it will not be able to break in because of the stability, if you understand. So, now that we had these concepts developed, some people started to uh, observe the role of these in the cooperation. And we are now in 2003, and a very important book was published, uh, a, a, a conference proceedings. That was the title. It was very significant because the title shows that these are two things coming together again. And as our landlord uh, said it, as a kind of a hobby horse, you need to leave your comfort zone in order to reach something. So this book in 2003, this was a, a, a remarkable and significant book. Now what happened? People started to experiment in a, 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 among a, a, a controlled conditions. And there was an experimental economist from Zurich. And he tested people among these conditions, on controlled conditions, as I said. Uh, and they made certain um, assumptions. And they replayed the game with people. And you could actually win or lose huge amounts of money. Imagine what happens if actually the, uh, this Otka, which is a tender in, in, in Hungary, what happens if you win a tender after which uh, actually you, you, you give a lot of money to the in participants? It's unheard of uh, in the Hungarian project life. Anyway, uh, these experiments uh, broadened our view, extended our knowledge. I'm not going to go into detail, but there's something I would like to emphasize. Cooperation and the observation of cooperation in under different conditions with experiments, with models, comparative studies, whatever you can think of. So cooperation showed the, the noble savage, yeah, this, this noble, that's the absolute bullshit category. Yeah? It has never been. It was a, only an idea, and we have very good uh, statistics and data, you know, of these groups of people who were hunters and gatherers, which are still there, out there. They have been around for the past, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of years, but if we look at these groups, we, we can make st statistics of them. And the statistics say that an average hunter or gatherer to be killed by another hunter and gatherer is larger than 10%. So decimation was a, a correct term. And this was not limited to the fact that uh, the males actually uh, banged one another on the head. This was uh, we went back to 13,000 years ago. And you can see that the hands are tied together. Males, women, and children are there in the in the in the, in the tomb. So they simply just killed one another. 
We don't know if there is a direct relationship, but about 13,000 years ago, there was a huge impact, a meteorite, most likely, which is pretty novel in discovery. And uh, at that time, the climate was still uh, fluctuating, and it made the climate even worse. And maybe uh, there was a, an increased conflict for the available resources, and that might have led to the killing of one another. And this is when people decided uh, this way to get resources. Now, this could be so much true that in 2007, Sam Woods, Ball, sorry. Uh, he was an expert on microeconomics from the University of Santa Fe, or the Institute of Santa Fe, produced an article uh, in the journal Science, and basically he offers a model for a situation, what happens in a hunter-gathering society and how conflict resolution may happen. And what are the ma basic, limited, minimal items that uh, the, this kind of uh, 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 account for this dual character? He says there is a strategy, uh, which happens very frequently, and it's a recurring action, and it re-dominates the society. And it means that it's parochial, and it's altruistic, and it says that one person is ready to kill the other without any particular reservations. Now, this article has been cited by uh, 700 times. It has been cited uh, 700 times, and a large number of people started to look at it. I mean, we don't know whether it's true or not, but this is a model, this is an idea, a concept, and for those who do not model things, this is an if-then kind of condition. If this is true, then the consequence will be such and such. So we don't know the, if the questions are asked in the right way, and what happens if we actually change the conditions. <laughs> now, as the cultured Chinese says, and he said something in German, but anyway, uh, after the classic article published in 2007, a lot of new articles have been published. Uh, there have been about 200 articles published on the issue. But there's one thing I would like to emphasize. And that is a consequence of the theory, and when at the time it was published, nobody foresaw that this might have such consequences. So it's very significant to learn what biological mechanisms mediate social patterns and social behaviors, and there are many, many things involved in this system. One particular thing that plays an essential role, and it's in, typically in mammals, is the oxytocin, it's a hormone, and very interestingly, when I was in secondary school, we learned that this is for uh, 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 the womb, when the mother is uh, having a child and then it contracts the womb, and well, oh, I have some oxytocin, but I, I am not pregnant, I'm not expecting a baby, but it's there in my organism as well. Actually, the territorial behavior uh, is an area where oxytocin plays a major role. Now, let's just get to the point. Now, if you buy oxytocin in a form of a spray, you can actually give uh, uh, in, in the form of a uh, uh, nasal spray to people. It doesn't smell, actually. So in a corporation experiment, they um, put some oxytocin in the people's nose, and they took a look how the, the behavior changed. Now, it was quite surprising to find that at the effect of the oxytocin, uh, the man involved in the experiment basically 
was they, they produce the same kind of behavior that comes from the model of parochial altruistic. So if oxytocin is given to people, men, males, there will be a large cooperation rate among the members of the group and it will increase the aggression to other groups of males. There is a hitch here because there can be two kinds of aggressions. One could be defensive and one aggression type of aggression could be offensive. And it shows that the defensive aggression was more likely to occur. We don't know what the discrepancy is, but this makes science even more exciting. And this last thing, and for Jim especially, I wanted to highlight this. There is a root mace, an anthropologist from the University College of London, made or organized an experiment in Northern Ireland involving Catholics and Protestants. They didn't know, obviously, that they were undergoing <laughs> an experiment. So they, they had no idea they were being tested. But there were two experiments conducted. The first was to f how probable they were to give donations to schools, how likely or intense they were. And secondly, if they find a leaf on the ground in the street, what is the probability? Sorry, a letter. It's the same word in Hungarian. So if they find a letter on the ground, would they go to a post office and would they send it, would they post it, uh, whether it's uh, the letter was written by a Protestant, a Catholic, or a Jew, for that matter. So in this experiment, the researcher found that it is true that this clue, in-group, out-group clue, is this is a decisive factor. So what she found was that people are, are triggered by the situation in order to be offensive to the outgroup, to the other group, or just, you know, in this particular situation, throw the latter into the garbage bin. But if they belong to the same group, their cooperation level did not significantly raise. Rise, sorry. So this did a side of the prediction is not as clear as we would expect. But it will be the future's task to see the contextual interlinkedness and effects that will shape the picture a little bit. When these models come out, you know, this model appeared in 2007, the author was not really serious to believe that it will generate some fantastic, you know, it will be pure gold and then, then he has found the explanation for all. But it was almost pure gold because it triggered 300 articles that observed, looked at the same thing from different perspectives, uh, comparative, anthropological, um, all kinds of aspects. And it seems now that the, the, the depth of knowledge has been extended. And then as quantum mechanics appeared in chemistry, that sort of extends the limits of our knowledge of certain disciplines. And that that will be fruitful even in a difficult issue like that when it's but it's not it's no man no girls game really we know that all these uh, problems that professor gelenchir introduced about the environment we either will need a kind of cooperative solution you know to combat this issue or there will be no solution and then we will be in trouble thank you for the attention